Okay, thanks very much. <clears throat> um, well, I hope everybody had a good little bit of networking. <laughs> it's, uh, it's one of the best parts of that, let's be honest, you know, about coming to conferences and events. It's really about what happens out in the hallways, <laughs> you know, the conversation and, uh, you know, farmers kind of processing the information, the lecture material amongst other farmers and bouncing the kind of ideas and questions off each other. It's, uh, it's such an important piece of, uh, piece of events. So uh, I, I even, and I, even I, of course, I appreciate that too. I love the interaction, uh, the questions and the discussion um, with the audience as well. So uh, <laughs> I've been sitting here twiddling my thumbs. I feel like I've been missing out on a, a lot of the, the good stuff during the lunch breaks and whatnot too. So um, anyway, I hope you guys uh, had a good, good uh, interaction. Okay, so um, let's dive into the last presentation. And um, yeah, as I said, I'm, I kind of ended up deciding we're going to take this a little bit in a kind of root exudate direction. Um, it's a really broad topic. I, like, there's so many things we could have discussed. You know, what's new in soil biology? I mean, there's so much. Uh, we're going through a really in the world of soil biology, we're going through quite a renaissance in soil biology. Um, particularly soil microbiology at the moment, you know, with some of the latest kind of tools, the newest tools that we have to measure soil biology. So things like this, the DNA and genetic and molecular kind of tools, they're very powerful and with very high resolution, we're, we're kind of peering into this world and realizing, I think the take home message is realizing that it is way, way more complex than, uh, than maybe what we first thought. Um, now, so there's, you know, 101 million different things or directions in which we could go. Uh, however, you know, despite some of that complexity um, in, in these interactions, I think, you know, some of the rules in which we can, or management strategies in which we can use to, to manage them um, and to work with them, it can be quite simple. They, they may be complex, they may be a complex system at an intricate level, but at a macro level, again, that's why I love things like the soil health principles, you know, just approaching uh, at that macro level, um, if we are following those kinds of guidelines, that's what is going to really help drive and support them and, and improve the soil biology through through some of those kinds of um, approaches. So um, that's kind of a little bit the view I therefore took, and then hence we're going to drill down a little bit into some of the really deeper specifics about kind of root exudates and their role um, on on soil biology. So here's what we'll cover, just a few kind of broader thoughts around soil health and the role of plants and that photosynthesis that we talked about and the role of roots and root exudates, how plants fit into the picture of soil health. Uh, just a, a quick point, again, linking about roots and livestock and grazing and cover crops. Uh, we've kind of heard a little bit of that this morning. So just kind of re um, summarize that in the context of then moving forward towards soil biology root exudates being as a key driver of that soil biology and then i thought lastly we'll wrap it up and explore some of these kind of root to root interactions that we see with some of the uh, uh intercropping or companion cropping type systems so um, i thought we'd kind of share some of that interesting work that's happening in that space at the moment so the message here is to think about um soil health just to raise the the argument that, of course, on the left-hand side there, the classic view of soil health, you know, the three-legged stool or the three-sided triangle of soil health is this combination of soil physics, chemistry, and biology. And that's the, the kind of the classic way in which we've often thought about soil, um, that it's about soil health is somewhere in the middle there. It's about optimizing some biological components, some physical components and chemical components, integrating them all together into this broad picture of, of soil health in the middle. Um, and I think that's all good. That's a great way to think about soils. But um, on the right hand side, you know, here we are proposing that, okay, well, of course, plants grow in soils too, and plants change soils. It's not only having good soil health so that we can support plant growth. Um, actually, the very act of plants growing in soils means that they change the soil properties as well. As those roots grow, penetrate into the soil and grow through that soil and release all those root exudates, the, the root systems, the plants themselves, they are changing the physical structure of the soil. They are definitely changing the biology as we'll talk about through those root exudates. And that biology is then changing the chemistry. 
So really our view of soil health really should include plants. They are part of the picture. Not only do they benefit from soil health, but they also influence soil health. And, and of course, that's why we grow things like cover crops, you know, green manures. That's the idea. We're going to grow those plants to improve the soil. So they exert a very important influence as well. And, and therefore, our, our thinking, our idea, our concepts of soil health should absolutely include um, plants uh, in that picture. And, and maybe we could argue that there should be a fifth uh, circle in this Venn diagram, including livestock, you know, especially for especially for those of you who are livestock integrated, um, you know, maybe we could argue that it's the same principle at play there as well. Um, so I think that more holistic view is a really important nuance and, and that's kind of what I want to dive into is the role of plants then in influencing or improving strategies to improve uh, soil biology. That's kind of how I approach the, um, the thinking there. And uh, as we heard earlier, if we want to feed soil biology, we're dependent on plants, we're dependent on photosynthesis. So that really means there's kind of two critical tools, I think, that we can use, practically speaking, to, to manage plants, therefore to improve soil biology. And, and that is really plant nutrition, as I touched on. Uh, uh, coming up next, I've got a slide. Um, plant nutrition, so optimize the nutrition, the, the macro and micro minerals to drive photosynthesis, um, but also uh, plant species diversity. You know, can we use different plant species because they have different cocktails of root exudates that are unique to those species? Um, and that if we use some element of diversity there or different strategic species that uh, they can then bring very some unique and targeted benefits. And so that's, um, yeah, what I kind of was just explaining this plant nutrition point of view. Yes, photosynthesis is all about sunlight and it is, it's all about air, the carbon dioxide and the water. This is the classic view of photosynthesis, but we also need the nutrients, you know, those essential minerals from the soil, those minerals acting as catalysts that we talked about, all of the macro, all of the micro, and they're all important. Not one is more important than the other, not, you know, MPK are not more the most important. They're, they can all and equally have negative impacts on photosynthesis and therefore plant growth and development and, and these root exudates, for example. So, so that's the picture. We really want to think about plant nutrition as a piece of the puzzle, um, which is this slide here that we, that we saw. And I think that's your two main tools, optimizing nutrition in the plant. And this is why personally, I'm also a big fan of the foliar feeding approach. That's kind of part of the strategy there. It's, it's to foliar apply small and targeted amounts of minerals, of those essential nutrients to prime this pump. And when we prime that photosynthetic pump, we prime biomass production, but we also prime those root exudates down the bottom there um, by supplying adequate nutrition. We are priming the photosynthetic pump towards production of roots and, and root exudates. And that's going to be the, the key of, um, of improving soil biology um, is just simply optimizing plants, living roots and those root exudates. And nutrition is a really key piece of that. And then the, the, the discussions around diversity or having more diversity through rotations um, or maybe some intercropping and companion cropping or maybe uh, cover crops or full season cover crops and grazing as we also heard about um, just earlier. So um, I think that's your two critical tools to really help drive um, root exudation. And again, that, that overarching point that it just, all of this kind of thinking still sits under that umbrella of, of conservation, agriculture, of, of soil health principles. Um, that, yeah, the more we integrate uh, these pieces of the puzzle, these various strategies, the more uh, overall that's going to help drive the entirety of the system. That's going to improve the physical condition, the chemical condition, and that's what's also going to help drive the biology as well. They're all very much an intellect, uh, interlinked. Um, uh, network there. So, um, so absolutely, uh, this overarching principles of soil health, for sure. And, you know, with a bit of a particular focus around um, this, this one here, as we'll dive into maintaining a living root, you know, as much as possible. And that's, that's because those red root exudates are emerging as such an important piece of this puzzle, um, highly digestible, highly available for microbial processing and highly efficient conversion into, uh, into that stable soil organic matter, as we talked about, but also just simply providing a highly efficient food source for them to do what they do, you know, cycle nutrients, scavenge that phosphorus, 
release the minerals for the plant, you know, all of those various uh, protect the plant from disease, et cetera, all those things that, um, that they do. And yeah, again, if it was livestock in the picture, you know, of course, just managing your grazing, you know, not overgrazing. When we overgraze, we're going to compromise roots. And as we heard about, roots are so central to uh, optimizing all of soil health, really. So yes, livestock are very valuable tools. I think, um, as I discussed, this, this keeping plants in that vegetative stages that really optimizes kind of that root exudation process, but then of course giving them nice long, the, the pastures nice long rest periods is what's gonna encourage more rooting, re-rooting, redevelopment there um, to help uh, those uh, pastures rebound you know, after, um, after, that, uh, after that rest period. So, um, you know, I think that the way that livestock in interact with plants, the way that they graze them, the way that they shift this rooting biomass and root exudation patterns is, is so valuable, is, is so, so useful. Um, so for sure, livestock integration is key. Okay, and for those of you that are just uh, cash croppers, um, sure, wherever you can use cover crops as well, you know, this is, might be therefore a more important piece of the principles, the overarching principles for, for some of you without livestock. And okay, here's the great um, review study uh, asking the question, do cover crops benefit soil biology? Does, does it help um, increase soil biology? And um, they did again, another one of these meta-analysis. So a study that reanalyzes lots of other studies and brings them all together to find some kind of overarching trends and patterns. So I'll just read you this one here. They conducted this meta-analysis combining, combining, compiling the results of 60 relevant studies reporting cover crops, cover crop effects on soil microbial properties. Overall, the key point here, they found that cover cropping significantly increased the soil microbial abundance by 27%, soil microbial activity by 22%, and soil microbial diversity by two and a half percent. So, so yes, across different studies, different soil types, different climates, different contexts, et cetera, et cetera, um, we get these kind of broad, uh, this broad signal towards, yeah, um, that cover crops do indeed improve various micro, particularly microbial abundance and activity very much so. So, so yes, living roots, plants, if you don't have livestock, um, this is still a great um, also strategy for, um, for improving soil health. But of course, even better if you can use both and integrate both. Always, the more tools, the better. That's why that's how the principles work so well is it's, you know, the more we integrate all five of those principles, the more, the more they all turn and turn in and benefit each other. So, um, and again, okay, we looked at this photo earlier. It's just again, to emphasize that point of, okay, if you're growing cover crops, uh, as just cover crops to return to the soil or to be grazed. Either way, yeah, definitely get down and have a look at some of those root systems. That's what's really uh, absolutely key in driving some of those. It's the roots growing down into the soil that's really going to be changing the chemistry, the physics, the biology, and really um, exerting that influence of the plant uh, over soil health. And, and yeah, that's the community of life that we're trying to support. Uh, all the way from the microorganisms, your bacteria, your fungi, protozoa and nematodes, you know, those smaller micro ones, um, they're at the base and they're really important for starting the, the process of digestion, uh, residue and root exudate decomposition and feeding and uh, cycling, solubilizing nutrients, uh, all the way up to the, these other predators who uh, then consume them and are continually cycling those, uh, those nutrients. So. Um, and again, yes, of course, earthworms, we all know the insects also really important for mixing organic materials and shredding and burrowing and mixing uh, particles and things together. And uh, of course, as we also talked about mycorrhizal fungi with that really significant um, volume of soil that they help to uh, explore the second root system of the plant, um, opening access to, to moisture and nutrients improving nutrient use efficiencies, improving drought resistance, other stress tolerances, all sorts of benefits that, that can come from mycorrhizal fungi. So this is the community of life that we're ultimately trying to feed and they all come together in that, in that uh, habitat in this underground world often called the soil food web. And, and of course, as you can see at the base of that food web is the food, is the fuel. 
it's the organic matter, it's the carbon, and that ultimately comes from plants, and that ultimately comes from photosynthesis. So it is the plants who are the key drivers of uh, providing the fuel to this food web. And then it's really just about all of those various interactions uh, in which fungi and bacteria will, uh, as the primary decomposes, they will break that down and incorporate that nutrients and the carbon into their bodies, into their biomass, whereby then all of these higher level predators can uh, then feed on them and process and cycle and, um, and uh, release of the various nutrients, et cetera, um, which can also feed back for the plant. So that's our um, you know, classic kind of view of the, of the soil fed, the food web uh, that we're trying to encourage um, all, the way, all the way up. And of course, soils are the foundation of terrestrial, all of terrestrial ecosystems. It all starts in the soil and it's the, through the, to these microorganisms, through to the insects, through to the birds and all of the bigger animals, through to the entire entirety of our um, terrestrial ecosystems. Soils are the foundation for, for all of life, you know, be that and plants, be that animals, it's, it all starts in the soil. Um, so, okay, what's new in soil? Okay, here's a good example of um, that greater complexity that we are just now beginning to kind of peer into. Here's a classical view of the soil food web. Um, here's a, a modernized version or a new version just from last year or so. Um, I'll, I'm gonna quite show you where this one comes from. And I put this up just for fun, really, mainly just to highlight um, you know, how much more intricate and so much, how much more interlinked some of the, the different microbial groups are and how we understand now how they behave or who they eat or what, how they interact, who they work with or against or, or that kind of thing. And it's, it, as you can see, it just becomes a, a more and more um, tangled web. But really, this is just saying the same thing as, our, as, as this image here in a more interconnected interconnected way you know it's still it's all about the fungi and the bacteria breaking down whatever residues exudates and then that those nutrients and everything flowing onwards and upwards from there um all the way up to you know there's a lot of interest in mites actually we realize that there's mites are a lot more diverse in soils that we maybe we previously thought and there's all sorts of mites that eat bacteria or fungi or predatory mites mites that eat each other uh, mites that eat nematodes, uh, you name it. There's all sorts of um, quite a significant diversity of mites in the soils um, that uh, that are all yeah interlinked and um, um, driving this kind of very detailed and, and intricate underworld web. And I guess a similar example would be something even like protozoa. One of the kind of newer findings about protozoa that again we've kind of really understood this with genetic tools. You know, when we look at microbes under a microscope, you know, all the bacteria, many of them can look exactly the same. And that's traditionally how we've classified bacteria. We grouped them as to um, how they physically looked to us. Um, but now as we use then more high powered genetic tools to then look at the various genes and group them into genetic families, we realize that, yeah, there is just so much more diversity of microbes um, and uh, how they all fit together in similar levels communities or families, despite the fact that many of them might just physically look the same, they can have very different genes and therefore very different functions, very different tools and benefits uh, and modes of action in which how they behave. And, and so, yeah, that was a similar thing with protists, with the protozoa, um, that there's that classic view that pr protozoa are really important to eat bacteria and then cycle those nutrients, particularly nitrogen in that bacteria. Uh, but protozoa, yeah, they're much more diverse than that. We have uh, some that eat fungi. We have omnivores. So we have some protozoa that indeed can eat both uh, bacteria and fungi. And even this unusual phenomenon where uh, protozoa can even eat organisms that are higher up in the soil food web. So there are some protozoa that actually can eat uh, or consume and degrade uh, nematodes, attack nematodes as well. So, um, and that's a very unusual kind of example that we've more recently discovered. So I, I just share like some minor kind of examples there really. Uh, I mean, another obvious one would be something like, you know, viruses, uh, of course, a hot topic at the moment, obviously, but um, the, the, the abundance and the diversity of viruses in soils and in, in the ocean, I mean, it's absolutely mind-blowingly ginormous and, uh, I just read a, a study just literally a few days ago that um, uh, had identified, again, through using some more of these genetic tools, had identified 
um, a vast number of new RNA-based viruses um, in a range of habitats around the world to the extent where um, <laughs> this one study has now um, uh, led us to realize that, well, from, from categorizing some of those, some of those viruses, uh, we have increased the virus, the RNA-based viruses that, that we're aware of by a factor of five. All of a sudden, there are, there's five-fold more um, of these viruses in the world than just a week ago uh, before they published their paper kind of thing. You know, so it's just, you know, these things are moving in, in incredible speeds at the moment with the, these genetic tools that we're using. The life sciences specifically are going through a incredible, all of the life sciences, true in agriculture, true in human health and all of ecology. You know, this, this microbiome um, piece of the puzzle is so vast, so massive. And um, uh, yeah, I'm sure a lot of exciting things will come out of that. It's a little bit very academic at this stage. We will wait and see how we translate this into practical and useful uh, information for us at the field level. But uh, um, I just share some examples there to set the stage. Now, if anyone is interested, uh, I, I, I threw this one in here just because it's a it's an EU report, and I'm not sure how much you guys maybe come across this one or have, have seen this one, but you'll find this online. It's a free version, a free PDF, State of Knowledge of Soil Biologists. This came out just last year or so, and um, it is about 600 pages, many hundred pages of amazing information and really beautiful photos, uh, some beautiful artwork and things in there. So if anyone's interested in diving deeper into a little bit of some of the current and latest thinking on, on soil uh, biology, I would highly recommend this as a free text. Um, you'll find a PDF of this online, just punch that in. And uh, there's some really good uh, reading material there. So um, it's very recent. And so well, what are some of the benefits of soil biology? Why should we focus on them? Why are they worth um, uh, encouraging and improving? Well, you know, with such diversity of this community, they bring a lot of diverse benefits um, with such, such diversity in which they exist. They do lots of different things. And that's, there's lots of benefits that can come from that, uh, including improving soil structure, and that can improve the rooting depth, uh, that improves nutrient access, moisture access, um, the ability to recycle, retain solubilized nutrients, and that nutrient cycling is really important, a big, big part of what, what uh, soil biology does. Uh, increasing water um, and nutrient holding capacity, improving water dynamics. Uh, they can help decompose toxins. Microbes are incredible um, detoxifiers, um, digesting and cycling organic materials as we've touched on already. And then it's all about those microbial metabolites, those mi microbial byproducts uh, that do all sorts of different functions too, like, like stimulate plant growth, like antifungal compounds that can protect the plant from disease, or as we also talked about this morning, some of these microbial byproducts and their dead bodies and the waste products, all these kinds of things um, can also be uh, adhered to soil mineral particles and um, um, stay, be stabilized as soil organic matter. So I think um, I thought this was an interesting one just to put a spin on this, ask not what your soil biology can do for you, but ask what you can do for your soil biology. I think that's a, a really good way. Yes, there's all these benefits and yes, they, they all stem from soil biology, but uh, also with a little bit of nurturing and some simple um, overall strategies, uh, this complex world can, can really thrive uh, with some simple roots and root exudates as we will kind of um, quickly dive into and finish off. So, um, we touched on this a bit earlier this morning, and I just want to share a bit more context and specifics around this. Um, but root exudates are really, for me personally, maybe you can um, sense my enthusiasm, but I find root exudates a really interesting topic. Um, I think this, they're, so, they're at such an interface of this, this complexity of this world of the microbiome and, and, and where plants and microbiome interact and, and all of these various exudates are so central in this kind of interaction, I, I find the topic uh, of great interest. And, and again, what's really exciting about this is we're going through this renewed renaissance about how um, intricate this process really is. The classic view of root exudates, you know, if you go back into some soil chemistry text, texts and whatnot, the classic view was we, we focus so heavily on, oh, plants release organic acids, plants release hydrogen, and they do this to to solubilize minerals, you know, to exchange minerals, to solubilize nutrients, release those nutrients so that those nutrients can be taken up by the, by the plant. 
Now, absolutely nothing wrong with that. It's uh, absolutely what happens, but it's just that it's half the equation. Um, plants also release a bunch of other chemicals, glucose, sugars, carbohydrates, amino acids, proteins, specific communication chemicals, all sorts of other things that they then um, speak to and feed and nurture all of the soil biology so that um, the soil biology will also release nutrients. Uh, and the thing is that the microbes around the root system, because they exist in such diversity, huge genetic diversity, and therefore they have a huge um, uh, re reservoir of, of genes that code for very specific things, uh, compounds, proteins, enzymes. And so point being, because of their diversity, they have a whole, a much bigger, greater set of tools in their toolbox in order to access nutrients, to unlock and cycle nutrients and solubilize nutrients. Microbes have way more tools than plants do. Okay, plants have 20, 30 or thousand genes. The soil microbiome has millions and millions of different genes. So you've got way more tools to potentially provide various functions. And that's why it's in the plant's interest to feed the biology uh, and let them use all of their vast tools to so solubilize those nutrients. And, and they're much better at it. They're much more effective at it. Yes, plants can do it directly themselves, but microbes can do it so much better. So it's, it's in the plant's vested interest to, to nurture and feed them. And here's an example, you know, so there are hundreds, if not thousands of different root exudates actually. And, and sure, the bulk of them are those, yeah, carbohydrates, the sugars, as we often kind of generically quote, um, amino acids and, and organic acids. Yes, that is the bulk of them. So, so yeah, sure, when we say, oh, plants release sugars through th as these root exudates, again, that's all fine. Nothing wrong with that statement, but it is a gross simplification of the true and intricate um, uh, diversity of, of root exudate cocktail. So, so yes, the bulk of them are these first three groups, but really under there, there's lots of other things uh, that all these other biochemicals, these are various compounds or, I mean, you name it, all these things that we can't pronounce or spell. Um, don't worry, um, I can't either. You know, there's just all of these various chemicals, biochemicals, and, and really the, the key message is just to highlight that what all of these things then do, what all these various chemicals kind of do, as we are understanding now, is that Basically, they are communication chemicals. They are signaling molecules. These are compounds in which the plant uses to communicate to the soil microbiome. Um, they are like on-off switches. Uh, some of these chemicals will turn certain microbes on, activate them, wake them up. Uh, some of these chemicals will turn the microbes off and shut them down when the plant doesn't want them anymore. So this is really what what all these things do. And uh, we're just beginning to kind of categorize these and understand more and more what uh, more and more what it is they do and, and that kind of thing. So again, a whole range of these different kind of compounds here, which we could spend forever um, kind of going through, uh, you know, and some of them where we know bits about already, like, I mean, strigolactones would be a good example. We know this is the root exudate that plants release to wake up mycorrhizal fungi, to activate mycorrhizal fungi. And it also induces uh, a branching of the fungal hyphae. So, so this one has a, a well-known kind of link with mycorrhizal fungi and, uh, and, and there's other examples kind of here as well. So, okay, all sorts of different chemicals and cocktails of chemistry that exists within uh, root exudates. And, and here's really that point about kind of on-off switches. It, it's really that the plants are releasing these specific chemicals and uh, along with the foods, yes, the bulk of the exudates are raw food, energy, but then it's these little chemicals that then help to steer the soil microbiome and activate the soil microbiome. So for example, um, we're taking these complex chemical names, as you can see here, and re-representing them as some nice colored shapes uh, for all of us um, um, simple minds. So, so here we're looking at a young seedling. And what's it, what is a seedling doing? It's trying to establish, it's going through that critical growth phase. What nutrients are really important during establishment Okay, phosphorus. Phosphorus is really important for that early root growth. So what this little seedling is doing is releasing a particular cocktail, a particular fingerprint of exudates, a particular composition that is attracting very specific, activating, waking up and attracting very specific microbes uh, that have a feeding preference. They like to feed on those root exudates. It activates them, it wakes them up. 
And so, it, for example, it might be that this little seedling is releasing lots of exudates that wake up some of the phosphorus solubilizing bacteria or phosphorus solubilizing microbes. So the plant is calling for help, signaling out, I need phosphorus. These phosphorus activating microbes will become active because they like to feed on that food source as represented by the little shapes. Uh, and so they will then deliver that phosphorus in return. Now, uh, of course, things change uh, as the plant moves through the development of the growing season. Now here it is moving through its growth stages. It's starting to think about reproduction and is shifting into reproduction mode. And of course, the nutrients that it requires for that process is also different. Again, let's use that example of boron we talked about earlier. Maybe this plant is about to move into uh, flowering, into reproduction soon. So it might as you can see here, it has changed the composition of its root exudates. Now it's releasing all these blue ones as well to try and activate and wake up this particular microbe who might be a boron solubilizing microbe, for example. So I, I share this to highlight this dynamic nature of root exudates. It's not that root exudates are just the same every day and they're released at the same rates every day. It is hugely dynamic, intricate process that is constantly changing. And particularly the plants are recruiting and activating the microbes that they particularly require at that moment in time. And here's a nice visual then representing this this kind of changes. Here we're looking at um, uh, different bacterial, uh, different bacterial groups here um, across different plant growth stages. Okay, so here's a plant at the same plant at the seedling, vegetative stage, bolting stage, and flowering stage. And of course, at each of these different stages, the plants are releasing very different root exudates and therefore activating or various different microbial or, and in this example, bacterial groups. So, for example, if you look at this, we can see this um, kind of orangey uh, color band here. You can see that this particular microbe is being activated and being recruited very constantly through the entire, all of those growth stages. It seems to be an important microbe that's always there. Whereas what about this purple one? You can see that, well, obviously early on in the more vegetative stages, the plant didn't really need much of this particular bacterial group. Uh, however, in the latter stages, um, they become more activated, more important, uh, clearly. Um, this kind of maroon, dark red one here, a little bit the opposite. They're a bit more active early on in the vegetative stages, but then they become less active later on. Okay, so you, here, here I'm just showing you how the, that dynamic nature of those root exudates changes over time, and therefore the microbial communities that grow around those root systems also correspondingly change uh, over time. The, the community structure of those microbes uh, is, is adapting and, um, um, along with the plant's uh, specific root exudates and those specific biochemicals, signaling molecules that it's releasing. So this is why I think if we come back to this point about, oh, how, do we, how best do we feed microbes, feed soil biology, um, you know, here's two of the food resources, one, stubbles, residues, litter, um, the other one, root exudates. Um, and we had this conversation already about carbon use efficiencies and how this is more indigestible to the microbes, so hard work for them to break it down and grow microbial biomass. This is highly labile, highly available, very efficient to be converted into microbial biomass. We had that conversation already. But if we think about it then in terms of kind of feeding specifically different groups of microorganisms or cell biology, you know, think about this litter. Um, it's, it's kind of really going to activate generally the microbes that are good at, for general decomposition, you know, uh, microbes that like to feed on cellulose and lignin and, you know, some of this kind of plant material, it's going to be broken down by some generalist decomposers uh, who are going to break all that down. And that's kind of different from these root exudates that not only are they highly labeled or highly available for digestion, but in those root exudates are all these very specific what I'm going to use the word intentional biochemicals, the plant is specifically releasing these little biochemicals, maybe intentionally, to drive very specific functions in the amongst that soil community. And so I think that, you know, if we think then about the soil armor principle, keep the soil covered with either stubbles and residues or living roots, 
Um, you know, that's often the way we think about that. And I think that's a perfectly good um, principle. And I would argue that a combination of both is also really good. Uh, it's not necessarily we want one or the other or one's more important than the other per se. I think there's time and a place for both. Um, but just pointing out that I think there is a real difference between living roots and those very specific intentional chemicals that are being released as compared to just raw organic litter material um, that is going through more of a generalized decom decomposition. So I, for me, I think that that's why the living roots soil health principle does kind of nudge a little higher um, in its potential benefits than simple just residue or, or soil cover. Okay, now, are both of those better than nothing? Absolutely, yes. Um, so for sure, and, and a combination or a balance of both is probably relevant, but I think that, that root exudates have a little bit of an, uh, an advantage for that reason. So root exudates, uh, again, let's dive a little, keep carry on deeping, deeper into this. They're a fascinating kind of thing, and uh, we're beginning to understand more and more about them. It's a, it is also an area of, of a lot of re research and interest at the moment. And it turns out that, like nutrients, when nutrients are coming into the plant, uh, they can be, nutrients can enter the root cells um, via what's called passive or active um, transport, passive or active mechanisms. Um, passive meaning that the expenditure of no energy, that nutrients just through a concentration gradient, they can move in. Um, that's a passive approach. Similarly, root exudates through the changes in concentration gradients. If there's lots of exudates inside and not so much outside, well, those, those exudates, sorry, can diffuse um, out. So we have these passive processes where some root exudates are just being leaked out pa very passively. It's not so intentional from the plant. There's just a lot of raw sugars and things coming out um, as a general process. Um, through through the root cells and um, through the root membranes. And there can be very sometimes specific channels to also support that. And even these little things here called vesicles, these are little packages, these are little bubbles of various compounds, um, uh, various kind of root exudates, all sorts of different compounds in there. And these things can also pass uh, through, the, through the membranes and be um, excreted out. I'm going to come back and sh show you a picture of these in a second. So there's many different ways in which exudates uh, are released from the roots, as well as these active processes. And this is where the plant will expend energy to build these very specific kind of transporters, these specific little um, bridges that will specifically shuttle root exudates out of the root cells into the, into the, into the soil to activate the soil microbiome. And it is these ones here that are under active control where the plant is intentionally and expending energy to build these structures to let these specific root exudates out. Um, these are the ones that have more uh, intention from the plant. Um, the plant is intentionally building those to release those specific root exudates. So um, again, just similar to nutrient uptake, there are these different pathways and different ways and means in, of which a root exudates are released. And here's those little vesicles that I was talking about. This is a, quite an interesting topic as well that we don't hear too much about when we talk about root exudates. The plants release these little vesicles called extracellular vesicles. And inside those vesicles, inside those little spores and these little packages, there is a whole range of different bio compounds, bioactive compounds, including, yes, yeah, simple sugars and carbohydrates, like again, raw foods, amino acids. But again, these very specific antibiotic or antifungal type compounds, uh, even um, again, pieces of RNA uh, are also released in there. Um, so all sorts of bioactive compounds are encapsulated in these vesicles and these vesicles pass out of the root system. And here we're looking at uh, one example of this, um, of the some of the antifungal activity embedded within these vesicles. And you can see here that um, we're looking at some pathogens uh, uh, pathogen germination, pathogen activity. And as we increase the concentration of these extracellular vesicles, as we get more and more of those coming out, you can see that, um, okay, in this example, this was on tomatoes, but uh, particularly you can see fusarium really drops quite significantly. Um, so those extracellular vesicles um, contain very, these antifungal compounds that don't have a very strong and distinct suppression of some diseases. Uh, there's a strong suppression of Fusarium, but as we move up in concentration, you can see that um, even for uh, Botrytis and um, Alternaria as well, uh, that they also 
uh, uh, decline, declining. So I share that purely for interest to highlight that again, root exudates are a lot more complex than what we typically simply talk about them as sugars, um, not only by their composition, but also by their means or mechanisms by which they are released. Um, so th this is an interesting kind of discussion. And, um, and also really interesting that, you know, the roots and uh, the root exudates and the soil microbiome, and this is really, you know, we hear this kind of a bit of an analogy that the soil is kind of the brain of the plant. I've heard this kind of thought, and this is an interesting study that would support that kind of thinking. Um, what we're looking at here is, is that uh, changes in, in, in genetic expression, D DNA expression in, in leaf cells or root cells after attack from an insect pest. And so what you're seeing here is that when an insect pest comes along and starts chewing on a leaf, all of those leaf cells, they immediately, certain genes in those leaf cells are upregulated to try and protect that plant and fight off uh, that insect pest. And here you're looking at um, the number of kind of changes to gene expression that was observed after the insect attack in the leaf cells. But also they measured changes in the root uh, genetic expression uh, in the root cells. And you can see here that there is a much larger number of uh, root related genes in, in, in root cells that were their expression was changed, either turned on or turned off or up or down, these kinds of things. Um, so when the plants get attacked by, for example, insects or diseases, that sends a signal down to the root system. And it is the roots uh, that distinctly change their root exudates and start releasing these um, stress-related chemicals, uh, a cry for help. Um, they release, they change the root exudation pattern to activate and wake up the, the soil microbiome, activate the microbes from the soil to come and help them, um, help the plant mount its defenses against the, the would-be attacker. So I, I just find this fascinating to think that here we are with a foliar attack, a leaf attack, and yet actually this is inducing much greater and significant changes down below, down in the root systems and the root exudates um, more so than what's happening uh, above ground um, in, the, in the leaf. Um, so... Um, and here's a nice visual example of this, then bringing in a little bit this, okay, so there's, there's part of the discussion, how we're going to shift into thinking about different plant species. And, and here's a really nice visual um, uh, kind of prompt on the difference of root exudates in different plant species. So on the left, we can see faba bean, uh, in the middle is soybeans, and on the right-hand side is, is maize. And so here we're just looking at one simple thing, the pH. And you can see that distinctly different plant species release very different levels of acid and alkaline, a different ba balance of acid and alkaline. Uh, legumes, yes, they produce very, very acidic root exudates. That's why they're great nutrient scavengers and solubilizers because they produce these very um, acidic exudates. Whereas you can see that the maize root exudates are a little bit more towards the neutral zone. Okay, so this is just to point out that different species have, okay, we're just looking at pH as an example, but different species have a different fingerprint, a different composition, a different um, cocktail of the various exudates that they release, which are many of which are unique to that particular plant species, that family, or even that variety. It, as I said before, it can go down to that level of, of specificity. So this opens up some opportunities of well, what would happen if we put the faba bean and the maize together under a companion or intercropping situation. You know, and this is, this is the conversation to open up, well, are there opportunities for us to then identify these, um, these synergies, these complementarities that, that may exist by bringing different plant species together? And, you know, one simple example based on this, well, of course, under very acidic conditions, in this, in this uh, bean rhizosphere, certain nutrients are going to be highly, become highly available under those very city conditions. Some of the trace minerals, for example. Um, what about on the maize side, under neutral conditions, other nutrients might be becoming more available. Calcium, magnesium, molybdenum um, becomes more available at uh, more neutral conditions. So of course, if we had maize and uh, bean roots intermingling, you know, that, that maize could be scavenging some trace minerals from this acidic root zone, and that legume could be scavenging some molybdenum from the maize root rhizosphere, um, that it also requires molybdenum, really important for nodulation, of course. 
So, you know, just a vi nice visual example is that there's then these opportunities to bring different root systems together and identify some of these um, um, synergies. Um, and uh, okay, I'm not. I'm, I'm going to summarize the key point of this. I won't be going through every every point on this slide. But here we're looking at um, then trying to answer this question of okay, do specific plants, uh, species, do they encourage specific microbes? Are there particular microbe groups that uh, a particular plant species is very good at activating? And this is kind of a nice summary slide of this. I will um, let's zoom in a bit. So we're com we're comparing a bunch of uh, monoculture cover crops. And then various, some of the combinations, uh, some various four-way combinations, and then we're comparing a, an eight species mix of those as well. And we're looking at a bunch of different microbial groups and to see, well, which of the, the which specific plant or combination of plants uh, led to the, the, the most activation or the best uh, optimization of, of particular microbial groups. Now, this is after a two month period. Okay, so this is going some different cover crops after two months, we've come in and sampled all of the rhizospheres to look at um, which of the microbes are, are most kind of active. So if I circle then all of the, the kind of the winners, um, which was the plant or the combination of plants that induced the, the biggest or best response from that microbial group, um, you can see here we have some different bacterial groups uh, that, okay, some of the mixes seem to be better at. Uh, okay, here we have a monoculture of sunhound was the best activator of uh, actinobacteria. Uh, here we can see oats did very well as a monoculture at activating mycorrhizal fungi and non-mycorrhizal fungi. So, you know, sometimes a monoculture is the best, um, but also we can see here and here, sometimes these more diverse mixtures um, are, are actually better. So, you know, I, I'm all for diversity. I think it's great, um, but it's not to say that it's going to always be the better option. There can sometimes be specific um, uh, you know, benefits or modes of action of a, of a less diverse or a monocultural system. And, okay, here's a nice example of, of oats winning, winning, the, winning the, the game to, to build fungi. So this is at a two-month mark. What about at nine months? So they came back and measured again at nine months. And let's frame this again. Here's our various groups. Well, at the nine-month mark, here's all the winners. Of course, there's seasonal variation and things change over time. But I thought this trend was kind of a little interesting, whereby with more time, as we move to the nine-month period, we start to see a lot more circles towards the bottom, you know, that actually it seems like this eight-way mix did really win out in maybe a bit more longer term. Um, but, okay, some diff different nuances there. So, okay, I just share that to highlight that there's this kind of work happening, uh, beginning to look at, okay, very specific plants and using them to, to stimulate very specific microbial groups. So I think as we fill more of these knowledge gaps, there'll be some really interesting kind of practical strategies in terms of using cover crops or using specific plant species or combinations of species towards this goal of um, repairing and rebuilding specific microbial um, aspects of the microbial um, community. And so, again, just a nice visual example. Think about a monocultural cereal on the left. That cereal has a certain number of genes, a certain number of root exudates that is limited, that it only it can, re it can release. So it has a certain fingerprint, a certain cocktail of exudates that it releases, and therefore uh, the various microbes respond to that um, where they will then grow in concert and work with that plant based on those very specific exudates that that cereal is releasing. Now, if we put a second plant species into the mix, a, a legume here, as you can see, um, well, of course, the legume now is releasing a very different fingerprint of exudates, very different composition because it's a different plant species. And really what that then means is that as those two root systems are intermingling, you, that um, the legume can actually start to benefit from some of the exudates from the cereal and the cereal can also benefit from some of the exudates from the legume, okay? So there's a synergy there that, that as a monoculture, they wouldn't be able to tap into uh, because the cereal can only release its related exudates, the legume could only release its, but when they're overlapping, uh, we can induce potentially changes in those exudates also, uh, but also that the two different species can benefit from each other's exudates. So we've got this kind of synergy here of Kind of, for example, one plus one equaling three, that together um, there can be 
um, greater benefits to the to the whole system. Now, it's not to say that this will always be a positive interaction. Of course, some plant species or varieties coming together could be very antagonistic, um, and that also happens. So it's not to say that um, always diversity is better. It, it can be, if they're um, antagonistic, it can be worse. So we've got to find the right combinations that of plants that are very complementary um, and not uh, competitive. But okay, there's a nice visual example illustrating this. And okay, another one, here's again, um, maize and, and faba bean. Um, you know, th I, I found this one really interesting. So here we're looking at um, this, this fact that, okay, what does a legume do? It releases specific root exudates uh, as it grows, some of which are really important to activate the rhizobia so that it can form nodules and, 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 and form that colonization. So that's what the legume does in its own interest. And of course, the maize releases its own exudates to help, you know, mycorrhizal or help other things for itself. But it turns out, as this study has showed, that actually the maize they've identified releases some root exudates, two specifically that were identified, that whereby the maize is releasing exudates that activate the rhizobia. Um, and also another group of exudates that basically enhance and support the nodulation process for the legume. So this is the maize releasing these exudates to help to support the legume and its um, goal of nitrogen fixation. So this is very interesting. Clearly, they're not just looking at each other as competitors. Clearly, the maize is evidently trying to help the legume. Why would it help the legume? Surely that legume is going to be stealing moisture, stealing nutrients, competing, competing, competing. Um, but as it turns out, we have identified specific and unique exudates from the maize that ultimately enhance rhizobia and enhance nodulation. Why? Because when those roots are intermingling under more companion cropping systems, what does that legume do? It's also releasing a lot of root exudates like all plants do. And legumes release a lot of nitrogen bearing amino uh, exudates, such as amino acids, such as those small pro peptides and, and proteins that we talked about earlier. So when we have root intermingling and the legume is pumping out lots of amino acids, well, guess what the corn is doing? Of course, it's scavenging those and um, um, for itself. And that very action of scavenging those amino acids and scavenging the nitrogen away from the legume keeps the legume's nitrogen fixation turned on. If, the, if that nitrogen scavenger wasn't there, well, what that legume monoculture would do is bit, all those exudates, would, amino acids would come out and that would build up nitrogen reserves all around that root system. And once it reaches a buildup of nitrogen around the root system, that legume will turn nitrogen fixation off. Okay, I've got enough nitrogen, there's enough there. I will focus growth in other areas, I'll prioritize other areas. I've now got enough nitrogen. However, when we have a, a nitrogen scavenging companion like a cereal present, well, and it keeps robbing, robbing, robbing nitrogen, it keeps depleting the soil nitrogen and therefore the legume will keep fixation turned on. So we actually see greater nitrogen fixation on a per plant basis um, under more companion systems than we do under, under monocultural. So anyway, just really interesting example highlighting that there are certain exudates whereby now we're understanding that plants really are uh, working together. And here's another example of this, bringing in also mycorrhizal fungi into the picture and, and for example, the role of mycorrhizal fungi in maybe connecting plant communities, if they're both mycorrhizal plants, that indeed if we have mycorrhizal colonise the legume and uh, it grows over here and then also colonises the um, the maize, well, now they are interconnected through this common mycorrhizal network. And that's also a pathway in which nitrogen can be transferred uh, from legume to, to, cereal, to, to any cereal if it's mycorrhizal. So here's a really interesting one, a uh, study looking at uh, uh, monoculture versus uh, companion systems and the influence of mycorrhizal or not. So let's start over here. I'll, I'll, I'll walk you through this. Um, so here we're starting off just simply by looking at mycorrhizal colonization um, of, okay, let's look at wheat, when wheat is grown as a monoculture, the yellow is pure monoculture, or when the wheat is grown with a companion, in this instance, a fava bean. So, okay, you can see here that when we grow wheat as a monoculture, the baseline coloni mycorrhizal colonization was about this 25 odd, uh, 30, 25 odd percent, 30 odd percent, there's our baseline. Now, simply that same wheat 
then when growing with a bean companion, having a bean companion around it, the colonization of that wheat with simply having a bean companion nearby, you can see was increased. We got greater colonization um, of the wheat when there was a bean companion nearby. Same trend over here. If we look at a monoculture of the bean, okay, legumes are good mycorrhizal associators. You can see it's higher than, than wheat. The baseline is higher than wheat. So under a bean monoculture, we've got around about this 40% colonization. Now, simply by adding a wheat mm -hmm. companion, uh, having wheat present um, near that bean, the colonization of the bean, uh, mycorrhizal colonization of the bean also increased up to 60%, okay? So this species, having this just simply one from one to two, this extra species present seems to encourage and increase mycorrhizal colonization, both of the wheat when it had a companion or for the legume when it had a companion, either way. And then over here on the right, right hand side, now we're looking at with and without mycorrhizal colonization, uh, inoculations, they included mycorrhizal colonization or not, um, uh, sorry, a, a mycorrhizal product or not, or inoc an inoculant or not, with or without mycorrhizal. And here we're looking at the uh, rate of nitrogen fixation, the nitrogen derived from the atmosphere. And we're looking at how much nitrogen did the legume fix um, with or without mycorrhiza under a monoculture or, or mixture. So here under the monoculture, as you can see, um, that with or without mycorrhizal fungi, it really didn't make much difference, that the bean fixed about the same amount of nitrogen, whether we inoculated, remember, this is a bean monoculture, pure stand, whether or not we put mycorrhiza there or not, the, the beans pretty much fixed the same amount of nitrogen. However, by adding a cereal companion, again, a nitrogen scavenger, wheat in this instance, simply by adding that wheat there, that wheat, what's it doing? It's constantly scavenging and stealing nitrogen away. And that forces the bean to fix more nitrogen, as I just outlined. So we can see that, yeah, sure, the fixation has gone up because now we've got this scavenger. Um, but then when we add mycorrhiza as well, plus mycorrhiza, we get a further increase in the amount of nitrogen derived from the atmosphere, the amount of nitrogen fixation, because that mycorrhiza bridge is directly shuttling nitrogen from the bean uh, into, the, into the wheat. Okay, so that is creating an additional pathway of nitrogen drawdown, nitrogen drain, and therefore keeping the fixation turned on even more so. Okay, so like fascinating example there highlighting that uh, some of the benefits then are very unique as we step away from the monoculture and we can achieve uh, some very interesting things in terms of end fixation, free nutrient supply, but also in terms of nutrient sharing. And okay, it's not just about nitrogen. Uh, all of this interesting work happening with intercropping at the moment is so interesting, really great to see. Um, and nitrogen is a really important part of that discussion. Yes, it is. And then having legumes as part of these systems. Um, but it's certainly not the only thing. Uh, there's many more um, potential interactions and benefits that I'm sure are not yet identified uh, that can also benefit more diverse systems. So, okay, one that we know, a couple that we know very well. Um, okay, again, with legumes, let's look at a le legume and cereal or grass, for example. Well, le as I mentioned before, we saw the root exudates of the fiber beans was very, very acidic. And when we saw the fiber bean versus the maize, for example. So those acidic root exudates of the legumes are very powerful. They're very strong. They're very good at solubilizing scavenging nutrients. And some of the nutrients that they're very good at scavenging is Okay, phosphorus would be one, calcium would be another. I mean, there's others, but, but that um, legumes are very good at releasing these very specific root exudates. Uh, these um, particular groups here, uh, phosphatases, these are um, specialist exudates, specialist enzymes that will liberate phosphorus from organic reserves. So it has this very specialized exudate that will liberate phosphorus from the soil organic matter it will mineralize that phosphorus from the organic matter, releasing inorganic phosphorus. So they are unlocking, releasing uh, phosphorus from the soil organic matter. And indeed, the non-P mobilizing species, as it says here, the, the grass or the cereal, can then absorb that, can then take up that liberated phosphorus. Now, if that was a monocultural grass uh, or cereal, it wouldn't have 
it can't produce, I mean, it can, but not as good as legumes, these, these specific phosphatases that are really good at releasing phosphorus and making that available. So by having the, the, the legume companion there, it is the one, its mode of action liberated the FOS and yet the cereal then scavenged and benefited from that. So it's, there's FOS, you know, it's more than just nitrogen. And let's look at some trace elements. I'm going, I'm going to zoom in here on this next slide. This is a better example of saying the same thing. Um, what we also see, another specific example of this is that, um, that actually the cereals, uh, the graminaceous kind of plants, cereals or grasses, they also can release very specific things um, unique to them. And one of these examples is something called a phytosiderophore. And this is, again, just one of those very specific root exudates that when it is exuded, particularly from grasses and cereals, uh, that it has a really strong affinity for uh, iron and some of the trace minerals, iron and zinc particularly. And it will bind to those iron in the soil and it will pull it, make it soluble. It'll pull it off the soil particles, off the soil colloids and form a, <clears throat> a chelate or a complex, a phytosiderophore iron complex. So like we, we looked at some of those images of nitrogen and carbon complexes earlier so along those lines. So this is a very specialized exudate that will liberate iron from the soil <clears throat> and form this chelation. And it turns out that then uh, some of our legumes, they have also a very special uh, enzyme. This is called ferric reductase oxidase. This is a very specific enzyme, uh, sp sorry, a specific exudate that then can grab onto that iron chelate and reduce the iron, make the iron active uh, for, for then absorption. So take it from a three plus to a two plus and take it in. Okay, so I'm just pointing out that first, the cereal had to release the phytoside therefore to liberate the iron, to get it off the soil particles. Once that happened, then the legume has a special tool, a special exudate of its own to then grab that complex, uh, steal the iron away and, and, and absorb the iron for its benefit. Okay, so and this is kind of similar process for zinc as well. So, so here we're showing that actually the cereal or the legume, the graminaceous plant, uh, the, uh, the grass or the cereal, that it can help the legume. It's not just that legumes help uh, non-legumes. Um, indeed, here's a specific mechanism of trace element cycling, whereby the legume is the one that benefits. And this is what you're seeing above. This is a monoculture peanut. Uh, this is peanut maize, but you know, it could be other legumes. They're, they're similar, they have similar um, mechanisms. So here we have a monoculture of peanut that looks very uh, yellow, it looks iron deficient. We have some iron or zinc deficiencies, whatever's going on here in this picture. Uh, this is on the same trial, same soil type, right next door, we have peanut and maize strip intercropping. And on the same soil type, this, this peanut in the middle does not look yellow to me. You know, and this is the, this is the mechanism uh, by which actually the maize or the cereal is indeed helping the legume. Okay, so we have other examples like this and these root-to-root -root interactions, which again, I find super interesting. And there are so many of these interactions that we just don't even know about yet. And I think that's why there's a lot of potential um, uh, in intercropping and companion cropping systems, because we're gonna identify more and more of these very specific kind of interactions that uh, ultimately will lead to better nutrient utilization from the soil. You know, look at fertilizer prices. You've got, I bet many of you have got lots of iron and lots of zinc in your soils, lots of FOS. Um, many soils do, they're just not, those forms are not necessarily available. They're there, but not necessarily available. And uh, here we have a mechanism by which simply adding a slightly greater diversity of root systems um, is able to liberate those nutrients from the soil, access them, unlock them, and make them available, thereby leading to improved nutrient use efficiencies and less dependency on, on fertilizer inputs. So, um, okay, there's some very hyper-specific uh, examples um, and benefits that will come from um, maybe some of these more diverse cropping systems. And a quick example also on soil physics. It's not just about nutrients and nutrient cycling or soil biology, uh, the chemistry, the physics and the biology, they're all interrelated. So uh, here we have a study looking at, um, again, just that step from one to two uh, in a fiber bean maize intercropping system and looking at how the, uh, the intercrop improves soil aggregation, a physical property of the soil. And as they show, um, 
the soil macroaggregates in the intercropping systems increased anywhere from 15 up to 60 percent, uh, just under 60 percent across three sites uh, over the two years of the study. So simply by shifting from one to two plant species, um, we this interaction of the root systems led to anywhere from 15 up to almost 60 percent increase in the formation of those aggregates. And therefore, we talked about aggregates earlier, how important they are for physically stabilizing soil organic matter. Uh, so that's really important. And those aggregates are really important for your pore space and your infiltration and your uh, water use efficiency. So what they determined is that intercropping alters the soil microbial community. And it is those microbes that then facilitates this aggregation process. So, so there we go. Diversity can also improve soil physics and uh, soil physical condition as well. Okay, and then just to wrap up here, we're almost at the end. Um, again, just to, to, to complete the full picture, um, it's not just that plants and their genes and their root exudates are the sole drivers of the soil microbiome. It is very much a two-way street. The microbes in the soil can also change the plant and change the expression of the plant, change the behavior of the plant. It is very much a two-way street. Microbes in the soil are also releasing their own exudates, often called microbial metabolites. The microbes are releasing their own signaling molecules as well, communication chemicals as well, for the plant, which the plant detects, and the plant will change its growth habits or uh, its processes um, accordingly. So it is very much a, a two-way street. It's not just that plants are the ones controlling the soil microbes. And here's a really neat study supporting, highlighting this. This was just done in a hydroponic kind of nutrient solution uh, split root design. So here we have one plant, um, but we just uh, um, separate two parts of the root system and grow the two parts of the root system into two separate growth chambers. So they're not sharing, they're totally separate growth chambers. Uh, but the one plant is growing into both. And what they did is take some soil, make a little soil water slurry, and then put that soil um, water slurry into one side. So here we've now introduced lots of microorganisms from that soil um, into just one of the growth chambers. What do those microbes do? Of course, they uh, found their way to the roots system, um, grew all over that root system where the root exudates are coming out to feed them, of course. And it turns out as they uh, sat there and grew on the root system, again, those microbes released their own signaling molecules, their own microbial metabolites, which the plant then detected. And the plant changed how it grew. Uh, it changed its photosynthesis. It changed its root exudate composition. It changed its pattern of root exudates, um, which were then uh, measured in the other half here, in the, in the other side of the, of the growth chamber. They were able to then harvest this uh, nutrient solution and measure the root exudates present. And they found that when you add a, a microbial inoculant, it induces these changes. It induces changes in root exudates and they could measure the changes over here on this side, therefore identifying that it was specifically the activity of the microbes that induced that change. So just pointing out that microbes too play a role and they're also influencing this root exudation process. And indeed, there's one very big communication happening back and forth um, between, between the plant and the microbes. And, and I put this slide up again, just to illustrate that example, we talked about these various other um, above ground microbial habitats uh, earlier. And again, just pointing out that the same in, the same complex interaction is no doubt happening. We've got all these microbes that live on the leaf or on the flowers or in the stem uh, course around the roots. And it's the same principle. Those microbes are also releasing substances, microbial chem communication chemicals, whatever, onto the leaf, into the leaf, into that stem, into the flower. Again, just that whole vastness and complexity of this um, organism, which we call a plant, but really is a plant and its associated microbiota. Again, similar to us human, there's more microbial cells on a plant than there are plant cells. Plants are outnumbered by microbes. They are more microbe than they are plant. And so just think about these intricate numbers of interactions across all of these different micro habitats that we still are only just beginning to understand all of these foliar uh, above ground related habitats. It's uh, vast and complex and fascinating. And I think that although it's all very academic and theoretical at the moment, um, there will be really applied and practical strategies 
that we can use to support this um, as we move forward in, in, the coming, in the coming years. So I think it's a very exciting time. So in summary, uh, yes, soil may well be vast, uh, a very vast and complex habitat, and not just soil, but the plant itself, those microhabitats um, in that plant microbiome equally vast and complex. Um, but no doubt plants are the best way to improve soil biology. Soil biology may be super complex and intricate, but simply just growing plants there, having living roots is a great path forward to nurturing and feeding that soil biology. And, and so therefore that means you wanna optimize your cash crop nutrition during the growing season. Make sure you've got none of those mineral limitations so that the, you're priming the photosynthetic pump, priming the production of those root exudates. Make sure you're looking at your trace minerals and your macro minerals and optimizing, use your tissue test, sap test, et cetera. Make sure you've optimized the plant nutrition status. Um, use cover crops, use companion crops, use intercrops. We've got different species coming in there. And again, those different species then also can release different and unique root exudates that can also drive some of these beneficial interactions. Uh, and it is, that's what it's all about. It's those living roots and those root exudates, whether or not you're in the cropping phase or in the cover cropping phase um, or in a rest phase, a grazing phase, you know, whatever, whichever part of the rotation you're, you're in. It's all about living roots and those exudates. They are the keys to, to feeding uh, our, our soil biology. Okay, <clears throat> thanks very much.